Hi, I'm Jacob Finley with Cochrane Supply and Engineering. Uh, my role in AI has been fairly new, and it's really been as a driver um, for the business entity, right? So not so much on the machine learning side and the large language model being built into an analytics platform. We've got other guys that are going to tell you all that cool stuff. I want to start it off kind of with what I call approachable or available AI that's easy for you to get your hands on and how the business and the built environment can use it. Um, so modern businesses have modern expectations. That's as everything from the HR department um, to social media posts. And most of our customers that we see, I won't say most, a lot of our customers that we have um, are still small businesses, less than 200 people that are still trying to get up to speed with those expectations of today. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about construction companies, uh, companies in the built environment, and just how large language models that you can get on your phone or on your computer, open AI, that type of stuff, um, can actually you know, get us into that next phase of business here. Uh, There. So first off, if you're in this room, you've probably been hearing about AI for a year, you've probably been using it, so you know these things, but just as a kind of reminder and refresher, um, something to make sure you're telling your customers about, um, and anybody else that you're interfacing with, um, these easy uses that I threw up in five seconds on OpenAI. So here's a marketing and sales example, right? Give me a very concise marketing campaign um, for my company, ABCGAS, um, and it spits out an entire marketing campaign. It's not perfect, it's not great. Everything that you put into large language models is going to be something that you have to sort through and edit, um, check yourself. But these are just a couple examples. You also have like an HR example here, which is um, you know, something along the lines of maybe you want to do a monthly post on LinkedIn for you know, employee of the month type of thing. Uh, so that's one option. There's also applications, like I said, at the bottom there for legal accounting. I mean, you can ask ChatGPT itself how it can help you with these things, and it will tell you. Um, but for the built environment, um, one way that we've seen it being used more often, which is interesting, is for um, construction documents. So there's a vast array of construction documents available online um, because of public bid and spec and things like that. Tons of construction documents available for these models that are already trained on it. Um, so if you tell it you need a scope of work, um, if you ask it to help you write an added work order, a change order, or look through a set of specifications, um, it's pretty good at it. It's got a ton of data run on the back end to, to, that it's already trained on. So you don't need to do a lot. You can use the models today for that. Um, here's an example of the scope of work I have right I mean, I just copy and pasted it right into Word and it's ready to go. I have the signature lines. I mean, these are productivity enhancers. This isn't replacing anybody. This is taking your team that's probably overworked and stressed out and giving them tools they need to be able to get more productivity out of their time. Um, one, one real big problem in the industry that we're seeing as a distributor is the skill gap. Um, this has a lot of implications to fix that. Um, there's one way that we're working on specifically, I'll show you an example in a second, um, but there's lots of different angles that you could use this for tech support, for getting guys a ramp up time before they get out into the field. Um, one example that we're working on at Cochrane um, would be this. So, we think we are, we might not be, but I think we might be the first um, company that has an open AI connector now working in Tritium. So inside of Niagara 4, we've got our open AI chat GPT model built and we've trained it completely on the Niagara documents, all the documentation, help files, all the stuff that's in the F1 help in Niagara has been trained. Uh, so you can see an example here, I just asked it, um, how to tune a BACnet network in Niagara. And it gave me a couple of really good examples. And it actually sources the PDF for the tuning file, digs through it, provides it so you can get to that document, but it also just kind of gives you a summary of how to tune a backup network. So we're looking at this for applications on how to ramp up field text, get them in the field working quicker, because we're going to need it with the skill scale. Okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, AI at multiple levels in the business of doing buildings and um, passive logic. Uh, what we're all about is, is we've, we started the whole company based on two principles, uh, how to bring AI and autonomous systems to the built environment. And these are all our technology and research areas, some of the products and software that you've maybe seen at our booth, and then what's under the covers of driving all of that. So, what I, what I want to talk about is, is you know, AI 
this is sort of the takeaway that you should have if, if you've experienced the last year or two of AI transformation. AI will absolutely be the foundation for buildings. And we see these three big spaces. Um, one, how we control buildings. Buildings will be fully autonomous. That will be the end point of this market. We will have intelligent resource networks. Buildings will be able to negotiate back and forth with other buildings and utilities on the real-time needs of their energy and resource needs. And then we'll build, we'll build these collaborative software workflows across our companies and across the different companies we interact with. And AI and digital twins live at the center point of this. And, and so I'll, I'll disambiguate, like, what are AI and what are digital twins? So let's, let's first talk about what is AI. How many people here feel like they have a handle on deep learning and how it works? Any raise hand? Awesome. So I, I want to make this point, like we just talked about ChatGPT and that's, that's awesome. ChatGPT is, is a tool that's very readily usable. But some of us in the research community are, are worried in the AI world that we see the same three things happen over and over again. Language models, image models, and, and you know, voiced text, right? And the world is full of lots of really, really cool applications and what we really need to do is get more of the research community working on more of these different applications, not just the same three things over and over and over again. But deep learning is really just a different way of programming. Instead of programming manually, we're training models and we use data and a thing called differentiable programming. So data, the first thing to understand about data is you need enough of it. And this is both uh, easy, because you can just go get data scientists, you don't need programmers, you can get interns to go put together data and you can train models. But you have also a problem, that you need enough of it that you never exit the trained world, that observed world, and enter the rest of the universe. And that's the data problem. And there's another problem is, how would you know if you did? And so, why are LLMs very successful. Why, you know, first, first LLMs have been in development for uh, a decade. They kind of entered the cultural parlance just in the last year as they become very accessible. Um, but they're successful for a reason, and that's data that humans have been labeling things for tens of thousands of years in all these different languages. And then we spent the last 30 years using billions of people putting all that language on the internet, and we could scrape the whole damn thing and make a model. No other industry has that. And so this is why you see so much LLMs out there because they're easy to make. But let's look at building. Every building's unique, right? They're not the same. No one model will fit all. And it takes, by definition, one year to get a data set. So for any given building, you know, getting a thousand data sets, which is still just very slim, would take a thousand years. So buildings need some other things, and, and that's one of the areas that we're interested in. So why, where do digital twins come in? So digital twins are a way to build models without that training history, that you can use this composability of things that we already know, the physics we already know of things, to generate models without all the training history, and then being able to run that across our workflows and work and, and enable autonomy. And when you have models, the other thing you need is differentiability. So what is differentiability? Differentiability is a way of training that blows every other known way of training out of the water by about eight orders of magnitude. So basically up until 2012 when deep learning came along, that was the application of differential programming that made deep learning possible. Prior to that, there are over 100,000 papers in academia and machine learning that are essentially now out of date because they, they are on the order of trillions, quadrillions of times slower than differential programming at being able to train models. So one of the things that we focused on, and I think this is just sort of interesting for all you guys in the building world, is you know, here at Passive Logic, we built what is now the largest differential computing team in the world, bigger than Meta's, bigger than Google's. Well, why? Because we see this opportunity to use training for all kinds of use cases beyond things like LLMs. And we, in particular, need to be able to do this at the edge, in real time, in, a, in, in an autonomous system. So what we've been doing is collaborating with Apple on the Swift programming language um, to enable Swift to be able to do differential programming. And we're today over three, uh, 300 times faster than TensorFlow, which is Google's uh, framework, 
200 times faster than PyTorch. This is open source. You can download it and use it today. And it allows us to do new kinds of things. So let's bring that to digital twins. So what, for us, digital twins solve a lot of problems, right? They're not just a data format. They're an AI format. They're a computable format. They're able to take us from one end of a workflow all the way to the other end of the workflow across the life cycle of buildings. And they allow us to use the same model that we might design a building with to do inferencing. And when we think about inferencing, we have three kinds of inferences that we're interested in. So inferencing is the AI term for running something. So it sounds fancy, but it just means running. But there's three concepts, deduction, abduction, and induction. And here they're formulated in the scientific method of how do you come up with a hypothesis, how do you predict, how do you make actions, and then how do you apply that back to reality. So, so okay, that's, that's AI, that's that center point. Let's apply it to what we have to accomplish in buildings, so autonomous buildings. Like, why is that important? Let's talk about levels of autonomy and what do we mean by autonomous buildings. It doesn't mean the same thing as automation. So automation, as we know today, what's existed for the last 100 years is what we call algorithmic control. This level zero autonomy is equivalent to cruise control in your car. In fact, both things are probably using the exact same methodology, which is called PID, or something similar. You see at the, you know, most of the things that we see in AI uh, utility space in buildings today are what we call adaptive runtimes or adaptive tuning. You still have the same control systems that you used to have. It's still probably based on PID or some algorithmic basis, but you have optimizers that are working over hours or months to tweak and tune and make them work better. But the underlying cruise control of our buildings hasn't changed, right? It's just like, an adaptive cruise control that's adjusting to the traffic around it. Level two autonomy would be, what if we had software that could generate sequences for us? So we say what we want, generate sequences, similar to what an LLM does. Jumping level three for a moment, because I think level four is where it gets interesting, is real-time sequences, where you describe what is my building, why is my building, and your control system decides what to do in real time. It generates its own sequences. Level five being full systems of systems. So buildings are interesting. They're more complex than other systems out there because they're not just a system. There are many systems working together. And that, that is what makes, from our point of view, at Passive Logic, buildings the most interesting robotics challenge in the world. They're more complex than anything else humans make. So you bring that together. So what does autonomy do? Not beyond just making our buildings more optimal, it provides cross-application multimodal management, meaning you can have all these different systems, all these different types, all being managed, co-managed together. So in today's BMS world, we have all these different control loops. Yes, you can network them together and get some data points out of them, but they're not actually being controlled together. What autonomy allows us to do is bring them all together on one roof and co-control them so that they're co-optimal as a set suite of subsystems all working together. And it allows us to take these digital twins and turn it into control, right? So we, we can generate digital twins and put that into a control platform that understands digital twins and generates those, those control sequences in real time. So smart buildings, autonomous buildings of the platform, allows us to solve some other big problems, and that's the workflow, right? It's not enough to have AI. What do you do with AI, right? AI has to do something useful. And for us, we all live in part of a building workflow. Is it at the design scale? Are you in the install business? Are you an owner operator? So what we think in terms of is digital twins as these AI computable entities that can be traded from the manufacture of equipment, to the design of buildings, to the design of autonomous systems, the application of those autonomous systems, to the owner operator being able to plug in services on top of that. So let's look at each of these and how we're using AI at different levels of that stack. So that same AI stack that we've developed, uh, we've built it so that you can use a cell phone that will scan with LiDAR and turn it into physical building geometry that you can interact with. We're using it to do generative building design, so you can you know, sketch with your building and let AI generate the rest of the building context for you. That you can inference physics, that you can do things like simulation, and simulation is pretty cool, but you can do it in reverse. You can go from this is what I want to have happen, reverse through that simulation in a reverse inference, 
to create the structures, the context that you want. So or the design ideals, the goals that you have. So instead of like normal simulation, you have an idea, you try it out, doesn't work. Idea, try it out, doesn't work. You can start with the idea, this is what I want, and go backwards through the physics to how to get it. Autonomous systems are basically built out of three things. Do I have a model for my environment? Input model, that's my sensors at IoT, and an output model. That gives me enough context that I can now control with. Using it for control system design. Once I have that model, I can use AI to generate the control system itself. And drive my point mapping, drive all my protocol semantics. And then that's that commissioning step. So we, we put in automation systems, we put in all of the systems that go into a building, and then the last thing that we have to do to turn that building on, to start leasing that building out, is we have to commission the building, and that can take a long time. It's very expensive, very expertise-driven. Well, if our building system already knows the digital twin of what the building's supposed to be, it can commission it for us and provide tooling around commissioning. And then going beyond analytics, um, you know, we've had a decade of analytics, um, anybody who's implemented analytics, which is still remarkably rare, knows that it still takes a lot of expertise to interpret the analytics, right? And so what we want is our buildings to tell us what's wrong, why it's wrong, and give us the root cause analysis. So why tradable models? Why do, do you need AI models or digital twin models to be able to trade? Because it allows us to put together workflows, the workflows for the way that the business really works so that we can work with all of our, our partners across the whole, you know, how do I survey a site, how do I retrofit design, how do I do my system, my controls design, and then how do I implement all of these operational tools that I, I want on the back end. And finally, intelligent resource networks. So if we have intelligent buildings and we have an intelligent workflow, what we're starting to see in the world is the rise of things like demand. demand is now becoming, in many cases, as valuable as energy itself. And we can't have demand trading unless we have smart buildings, right? And so here's an example of a building system interacting around dynamic demand charges, spot price management, being able to do uh, futures trading around the allocation of energy that it's pre-purchased and then being able to trade in a real-time demand sense. So those, those are, um, three domains in which we see AI being crucial, the platform, how we interact between the buildings as agents in an energy network, and then building those network uh, um, workflows across how we operate from design to implementation to install to, to managing our, our assets. So, appreciate it. So, uh, Troy gave a very great explanation about, um, you know, what some concepts of AI and how it works. I'm going to kind of go in another direction about why AI. So I want to give uh, some shout outs first to Ken Sinclair. Thank you, Ken, for uh, sponsoring this. Um, Paul Campbell, my VP of AI and Machine Learning, um, we've been on this road together for a long time across multiple companies. And then also Brian Tarver, our, uh, the VP of Business Dev at, at TCS Basins, our latest partner, um, he really informed the theme of this and I, I kind of ripped off his slides with his permission uh, for this approach, but he really summed it up the best, in the best way I, I can see it. Why AI? So the opportunity, I mean, we all know this, everybody knows that, you know, buildings are the largest energy users, 40%. They routinely waste 30% uh, of that, and they've been doing that for about 100 years. Um, we've had the antiquated PID loop, as Troy um, pointed out, for 120, 100 years. Uh, literally, the PID loop was invented in 1920s, so we're just over 100 years. Nothing's changed. We moved the control from pneumatic controllers to, electro to electric, to electronic, to DDC and now moving off into the cloud and beyond, but still at the heart of it is the same old error reacting, you know, re you know, reactive PID loop control. So we're here to kind of help do something about that. And then that contributes to, uh, you know, lack of efficiency in our buildings. So I'm gonna start with a little thing called, uh, and this is where Brian kind of came in with, uh, everybody knows. 
So everybody knows that we only use 10% of our brain. You know, everybody knows that. Um, everybody knows that lightning never strikes twice in the same spot. So my dad told me that. His dad told me that. And then every little kid knows that, you know, you pick something up, you drop your ice cream cone on the front lawn, five seconds, you're good. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff like that, however, in the building controls industry. I mean, we've, we've come up, there's all these things that just everybody knows. Uh, we know, for example, you know, according to the DOE, uh, every degree you raise your set point, you're going to save 3% on your energy bill. You know, no cost tip, you know, let's, let's, let's have our occupied set point at 76, 78, 80 degrees, and man, 90 degree unoccupied set point, and, you know, it's 90 degrees a minute before 10 when the store opens up, and surely that HVAC system using that pit loop is going to bring that temperature down to 72 degrees within, you know, a couple of minutes, maybe. Never. So, uh, yeah, but everybody knows that. Yeah, like I said, you know, if, if 5 degrees is good, let's do 10 degrees, you know, 20, you know, Death Valley, California, you know, let's just raise it up, you know. And, uh, yeah, we don't think about the physics of uh, heating up a building and the infrastructure at night, but um, yeah, we, we've been operating our buildings like this for, you know, a hundred years. And then everybody knows the best way to use the BMS is to act like a, you know, virtual, you know, like you're, you're the set point police. You know, don't touch that thermostat, you know, it's a virtual thermostat cover. You know, like the FBI is here, you know, what are you doing? Don't touch that thing. But it's time to question what everybody knows. You know, we're, buildings continue to waste 30% of their electricity, and, and it's time we, we did something about it. So, you know, what we can do is we can become, you know, we can have digital maturity, and we can apply AI and technology, machine learning, and modern technology to this situation. So, um, I've been in this, in this industry for a long time since I was a much younger man. I've been doing this for 40 years and started when I was 22. I'll be 62 next month, so I've been doing this for quite a long time. Um, and I started questioning, um, you know, what we were doing, like why it wasn't working. And I kind of, um, Tracy alluded to it this morning, I kind of questioned, it's like, you know, 2018, May 18th, Saturday morning, I got up and I'm like, man, everything we're doing in building controls is like we're just not, we're not making much, we're not making headway. And I termed it building as a battery. So why not use the infrastructure of the building, you know, cool it down. We're, we're, airhead, we're airheads. Um, we, we think literally about HVAC. Like that's how we think. We don't, we don't um, get, our, get concerned about the radiation in a building and, you know, the other things like, you know, the floors, the, the walls, the very infrastructure of the building. So uh, we turn buildings off dead as a doornail you know, at night time to what I alluded to earlier. And um, yeah, I just started rethinking um, that strategy. And then that coupled with uh, um, AI, which I had actually gotten to about 2004, I had another company that had nothing to do with HVAC. It was actually a CSI company called Shield Ops. It was actually featured on CSI. And it was the first application of AI to um, solve crime. So we put like 500, you know, murderers, gangbangers in, in, in jail in one year. We were the most, the Santa Ana Police Department was the most successful police department in the whole world, according to Interpol. And that's because it was two cops and uh, the, the AI system that I developed in, back in 2004. So I've been, I've been doing this AI thing a long time, not just, you know, since ChatGPT came out last year. <laughs> So we're using AI and machine learning to optimize HVAC. Um, you know, I, I turn it, it's, it's like what Troy talked about, adapted, you know, adapted, adapted energy management. We're uh, kind of a bolt on to on top of the, the, you know, the ancient PID loop, you know, reactive. I always say, if you use the PID loop to control your Tesla, you'd already be off the road, you know, and it'll correct the steering and the wreckage, you know, correct it. <laughs> Too late, uh, totally reactive. Got to have some little, a little bit of forward prediction here. And uh, 
that's what it kind of looks like, a conceptual like diagram of it. It's PID plus AI machine learning. And the great thing is you don't have to rip out your existing building control systems. Our, our stuff goes uh, connect seamlessly using the um, software gateways, no hardware on-prem. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're able to bring this AI and technology, AI technology to bear. Um, and there's a bunch of useful information at the bottom there. You can use history to predict the future, um, weather, occupancy schedule, ADR inputs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I, I kind of look at this diagram, I'm like, you know, how could we not do a better job? You know, how can we not save 10, 20, 30% on a, on a customer's electric bill? And, and we are doing that at scale. So one of our latest uh, retail customer has 1,400 stores, five, 6,000 RTUs. We saved them a million dollars last month. In one month, a million dollars on a $4 million electric bill. Um, and the way we're doing that is a, you know, a little bit of modeling. So we don't, we don't have to really do these um, theoretical models. We have access into the telemetry of the building, a, building control system. So we're bringing in all the inputs um, and all the parameters of the, of the chiller or the RTUs or whatever, they're like snowflakes. So we've got all that data, so we're creating a, a, a real-time model, and then, we, and then we, we're changing, you know, over an iterative basis. We're changing the output uh, based on, on feedback, on feedback loop from the input. So, um, great example, uh, before I left, we were, we were doing some condenser water reset stuff um, at, a, at a customer site. And uh, yeah, it's been cool out in, in LA, so it's been down in the 40s, you know. <laughs> I know that's nothing to you folks out here, but yeah, it was pretty cold. And so we couldn't even really model, we didn't have any information or historical data. So he, you know, Kenny out there, Cal State Dominguez Hills has a SkySpark. So he just loaded up a trend from SkySpark from August and, you know, I trained, I trained our AI on it. And, you know, as the weather starts getting warmer, um, it's, it's pre-trained. Um, really based this building as a battery off of a paper um, by James Braun from actually it started from the 1990. Um, he talked about Braun in this paper, uh, low control using building thermal mass. He talked about using the infrastructure of the building. Um, you could you could get up to you know 41 percent energy savings. Uh, we haven't been able to achieve that, but we're getting pretty close, pretty darn close. Um, you can see, for example, like night setup, setback, which everybody's using, like Brown found out in his field setup, as we have, that there's zero percent energy savings to it. Like you're wasting the most maximum amount of energy possible. Um, Tracy ended up mentioning this earlier, the earlier session, but yeah, in a former life, I had a, I had a company um, that had 16,000 retail buildings connected together, so it's kind of like my little experimental playground you know we had a large pharmaceutical i mean a drugstore i call it thrifty but yeah they had 2000 24 7 365 stores that open all the time 72 degree set point constantly and then they had 2000 uh, ones that went off there every night so they were open. and you know trick question you know which which portfolio used less energy well it's 24 7. they say they routinely use eight to ten percent less energy so the question is why? Well, it's kind of like driving down, you know, the highway at 55 miles per hour, slow and steady, got some momentum. You know, buildings have momentum. So I mean, people laughed at me; they thought I was crazy. Like that's not going to work. Oh, you're going to run my stuff at night. Yeah, I kind of want to run it at night when it's uh, cheaper, it's cooler outside. I mean, there's just this concept of the, you know, dual normal temp temperature, the difference between in a desert. It could be 105 during the day, like. 60 at night. So when would I rather use that energy to charge up the building? Well, nighttime probably makes it, you know, probably cut down your peak demand as well. So our, we've learned so much about, in, you know, for example, retail buildings that we don't have to do the machine uh, learning period anymore. It used to take two weeks to, to a month for our system to learn about the building. We've got these, I call them, they're like playing cards, man. I mean, we just, you know, we've got these five different templates and it just, it just deals out the strategies tweaks them over time and, and figures out which one of the possible, you know, 18,000 different combinations uh, works best for each building. And that's, that's how it works. And it just gets better and better and better and better as time goes by. So yeah, to close, we should strive for digital maturity. Um, 
you know, World Economic Forum came out and they said that, yes, yeah, it's, it's the measure of a building or portfolio's readiness to apply AI and technology to their portfolio to reduce carbon intensity. And it's vital. And buildings that lack this digital maturity are on path to becoming obsolete. Like, that's already happening. So they're going to start valuing buildings and their portfolios and even their operation and your company based on how much you're impacting or lack or not impacting your carbon. So AI is here right now. It's in it's in the field. We've been up and running for four years now. We're saving customers every every day millions of dollars. So I mean it, it's here and it's a it's a force multiplier. It enables energy savings, enhanced comfort, um, workforce reduction. You know to a certain point, or you can redirect that workforce to doing more beneficial things around the facility instead of you know nurse maiding the, the central plant. You know, through different three different shifts, and you have three different outcomes depending on who's you know at the wheel. Um, it brings that certainty, that budget certainty, to the customer, and there's a lot of business drivers for that. And uh, yeah, I'll close with my favorite quote: "The factory of the future will have only two employees, a man and a dog. The man will be there to feed the dog, and the dog will be there to keep the man from touching the equipment." <laughs> and that's why we need AI. Thank you.